talking about Jerome Powell. Seen here, learning why people are buying Dogecoin right now. Now this guy was not expecting to spend the pinnacle of his career writing reports about meme stocks, but here we are. The Federal Reserve just released their quarterly financial stability report, and the results were rockier than a list of great Stallone movies. The report has two dueling themes. Now first, you have the headline grabber, America's current investing strategy, which is, well, the arrow's pointing up right now, so I'm gonna buy. Underlying value, you sound like my granddad. Let's blast Doge going to the moon. Now it might seem like I'm dogging on people who have made millions over the past few months because oh you didn't invest the way my textbooks told you to. You have to drink your tea with the pinky in. Not at all. If you're making a profit and not under investigation, you're doing something right with your investments. The problem is when your entire definition of value is based on whether someone else is buying or holding onto an asset, it's going to be a much bumpier ride than if you're betting on the underlying values. Now that volatility can either result in a fortune being made, as we've seen with Bitcoin, or a fortune being lost, as we've seen with Bitcoin the next day. So why is the Federal Reserve monitoring all this? Well, their worry is that someday the arrows might stop pointing up. At that point, some investors and institutions will be stuck holding on to the hot potatoes. Wait, how much did I pay for AMC stocks? Oh man. Now, there are two ways of assessing this problem the individual level and the systemic level. Because we're talking about the Federal Reserve in this episode, the name of the game is keeping the system together. If you as an individual investor lose your money, call Congress for welfare or a bailout. The Federal Reserve's job is to make sure that the too big to fail banks and financial institutions don't pull a 2008 and run out of cash. Should risk appetite decline from elevated levels, a range of asset prices could be vulnerable to large and sudden declines, which can lead to broader stress in the financial system. Now, to explain the worst case scenarios, let's briefly go back to 2008. A significant number of people begin taking out loans from banks to buy houses. Those loans become incredibly valuable on the secondary market because well, the arrow's going up. It's not gonna go down. And a bunch of banks start to hold their reserves in those assets. Because, well, it's super safe. It's a bunch of separate home loans bundled together into one asset. There is no way all of those people are gonna default at the exact same time. Now, some of the warrior banks insure those holdings. Because, well, it can't be too safe. Then the arrow starts pointing down as massive numbers of people default on their home loans. Bank reserves go up in smoke as that asset falls, and insuring companies like AIG suddenly have so many claims that their future is on the chopping block as well. Eventually, the government, and the Federal Reserve specifically, have to swoop in and buy a bunch of those loans to recapitalize the banks and sell the insurance companies off to third parties for scraps. Today, the Federal Reserve is watching the rise of these anomalous stock and coin investment strategies, embracing themselves for the worst. Now, before I get to the next part of this episode, I want to emphasize that my crystal ball, well, it's currently in the shop, and my tarot cards, they keep coming up to a clubs. There's no guarantee that anything is a bubble in the market right now. We could just recover from the pandemic and businesses could pick up in a way that would make this episode look really stupid in a few months. That said, the Federal Reserve seems to be giving the financial world quite the side eye right now. If you're the Federal Reserve and you're seeing a bunch of money chasing after assets based on trends rather than value, you really have two core options to look at, raise rates or brace the system. The Federal Reserve raising rates is the effect of deflating the bubble slowly. There's no pop, it's just a gradual sss as money gets reinvested. The idea here is, okay, I get risking a bunch of money in the stock market when the only profit you're going to see in your savings account is that free toaster upon opening. 
What if we give you a 3% interest rate though? Maybe you want to play a bit more conservatively if we can make it worth your while. Now of course this has the negative side effect of slowing the economy down and slowing economic growth because money is being diverted out of investments and repurposed as savings. Now that downside makes this option a no go for the current Federal Reserve. Instead, Jerome Powell, well, he's got the kamikaze in his eyes and he's going to keep the interest rate steady. Fed officials have said that they expect to leave rates on hold through 2023. Policymakers plan to continue the current rate of bond purchases until the economy makes substantial further improvements. So, with the Fed continuing their program of very cheap money and making conservative investments almost barely profitable, we find ourselves looking at option number two, protect the banks. Now this is where we can actually breathe a collective sigh of relief, because institutionally speaking we are in a very good place and a different place than we were back in 2008. Unlike back then, Americans are writing checks that their butts can cover. In December, the Federal Reserve circled the wagons and performed stress tests on the too big to fail institutions. Now, the idea here is to manage the economy like a bored teenager on SimCity and see how badly you can theoretically burn things to the ground. Now, they ran two hypothetical stress tests here, with severe global downturns and substantial stress in financial markets. The analysis ended up showing that risk based capital ratios for all the banks would remain above the minimum requirements under both scenarios. Yeah! Basically, even if everything goes completely wrong in the next few months, banks shouldn't be running out of money. The reserves are being held in boringly secure assets. Now that limits the risk to the Federal Reserve of letting it ride. Of course, the Federal Reserve's decision to keep monetary policy as loose as possible for the foreseeable future is nowhere near unanimous amongst the bankers. Take for example Dallas Federal Reserve Governor Robert Kaplan who came out swinging when he said, we're now at a point where I am observing excesses and imbalances in financial markets. I'm very attentive to that and that's why I do think at the earliest opportunity, I think it would be appropriate for us to start talking about adjusting those purchases. Basically, we don't need to fully tap on the brakes and begin raising rates, but we should really ease off the gas a bit by slowing our monetary printing and bond buying programs. Make money a bit more expensive and investors might slowly become more risk averse. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell swung back and defended his position by first acknowledging the obvious risks. He says you are seeing things in the capital markets that are a bit frothy. Some of the asset prices are high. Yes, Jerome Powell likes his economy like he likes his St. Patrick's Day beer. Green, but no froth. But then Powell argued that a growing number of vaccinations and a faster economic reopening were the main forces driving prices higher, not Fed policy. Now, furthermore, he backed up his decision to not act by basically saying, even if we are wrong and headed off a fiscal cliff, I ran the numbers and the banks have golden parachutes. Powell also pointed out that some of the other factors that the Fed looks at to assess financial stability risks are not flashing red. Household balance sheets are in good shape, leverage in the financial system is not high, and banks are well capitalized. Now, From a majority of the Federal Reserve's opinion, the risk of acting is slowing America's economic recovery, while the risks of inaction seem to be a skin deep wealth reduction. People might lose their savings with overly risky investments, but it's their savings rather than their debt that can be defaulted on. Also core economic infrastructure has largely said, eh, I'll pass to these riskier investments. A collapse might not lead to the financial crisis we're used to talking about on this show. Just upper middle class people becoming middle middle class people and a news cutaway talking about how the Dow Jones is plummeting before cutting back to a panel discussion on potato heads true gender identity. 
Basically, in the current Federal Reserve's mind, the upside risk of slowing growth outweighs the downside risk of a collapse caused by potentially overvalued assets snapping back. Now, until something or hopefully nothing happens, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.